So this lecture is going to be a little odd at this point. Um, I had some slides. What I wanted to talk about today, because we're at sort of this point in the semester where folks are partway through lab three, but I haven't seen a lot of questions generated with lab three yet. So I was going to do one of these lectures where I talk about something that's not of direct and immediate relevance to a lab, but that is of general relevance to microcontrollers and specifically uh, DC motors and hooking up the circuitry for DC motors. So I had some slides prepared for this, which now that I'm on a new PC is going to be difficult for me to pull up, but I can likely use, I'll use the course website from some previous labs to take a look at some DC motor stuff. And then I also have one set up so that we can actually look at um, one of the things that we're, uh, we're going to show that you have to think about a lot when working with DC motors is protecting your CPU and protecting the rest of your circuit from the motor. Um, they kick off a huge amount of noise, which can be really dangerous to other stuff in your circuit. And so building a circuit that accommodates a DC motor takes a little bit of thought. And I want to sort of justify that with some scope traces from a motor running in real time. So we can do that. And then we'll look at the uh, course website for some examples of circuits, I suppose. So it'll be perhaps a little more scattered than I would have liked. That's OK. Any other questions about anything before I get started? All right, I'm going to share my We're going to make this the most 21st century lecture ever. I'm just going to basically lecture like from a Wikipedia page, probably. Let's do that. So let's talk about DC motors. Why talk about DC motors? There's a, so there are a bunch of different motors that we could talk about. Um, we're going to use servo motors in lab four. So I'll save my discussion of them for another lecture or two. Um, there are stepper motors, which we could talk about, and they have sort of a different set of applications than the DC motors. The DC motors are just super common. Um, they're free spinning. You apply a voltage, they start spinning. You apply a voltage in the other way, and generally speaking, they spin the other direction. So they're really nice for applications where you just need a thing to spin at quite high rates. So think like driving the wheels of RC cars, or if you're building some one of those mechanisms where you have LEDs on a string and it spins, you know, and you sort of illuminate the LEDs to build up a picture, that sort of application where you're just looking for fast spinning, maybe with some control, if you have some feedback, you can do some speed control. Um, what these are not well suited for are things that involve high fidelity position control. It's quite hard with a DC motor. You probably want something like, uh, a servo, perhaps, or a stepper motor. So there's a different set of applications for the different flavor of motor. But let's talk about DC in particular for today. And what I'll start by discussing is just the, the internal mechanism of how these motors actually work. Because as we'll see, it's, it's these mechanisms that cause the effects in terms of noise and such that we have to worry about. The, the, the noise comes from the internal mechanisms. So let's talk about one first and then the other. And I'll start, I suppose, by just showing this picture because it seems like a good one. So generally, there, there are a bunch of different types of DC motors. They all, as far as I can tell, operate on a very similar principle where the idea essentially is that you have, you set up some magnetic field within this structure. In this case, the magnetic field is being set up by two permanent magnets. And then inside of this, um, of this magnetic field, there's what's known as an armature, which is the spinning mechanism. And what the armature actually is, is a, a loop of wire through which we put DC current. And you'll remember from some physics, what physics class would it be? I guess probably an E and M class that if you have current running through a conductor inside a magnetic field, that conductor will feel a force. So when we put current in one direction through that coil inside of the magnetic field, it feels a force and the whole armature will rotate. And if you put current in the other direction, the armature rotates the other direction. And probably they have an animation of this. Indeed they do. So you can see approximately what's going on here where we have some magnetic field being established. 
current is being placed through, put through this armature, which is inducing force in opposite directions on either side of the armature, which causes the armature to rotate. And you can imagine that if current was flowing the other direction, the armature would rotate the other direction. What you're seeing in the foreground, this circular piece, is called the commutator. And this solves a tricky problem, which is for this particular construction of a DC motor, the way that we are making the motor work is by putting current directly into the armature. The armature spins, right? So clearly you can't just use wires to connect to the outside world because they would very rapidly twist themselves up. Right. So what this does is it is it is essentially a ring shaped brush where all of the uh, brush fibers are conductive elements. And it is generally speaking, it is it is sort of spring pressed against this armature so that the armature can spin on top of this brush mechanism and it's free to rotate. But electrical contact is maintained. Now there are different flavors of DC motors, so-called brushless motors where the armature is a permanent magnet and the, the exterior elements here, which in this picture are permanent magnets or electromagnets with, with fields that can be manipulated so that you can spin the armature on the inside without using a brush mechanism. You're manipulating the outside element and causing, and causing the armature to spin. Um, the, the DC motors that we've used in labs pre, in previous semesters in this class have been brushed motors. So they're the ones that I'm going to sort of talk the most about, but just be aware that there are other flavors of these things. Um, one thing I'll note is, and you can kind of see it by looking at this animation is you can see how there's an effect with DC motors called torque ripple. And this comes from the fact that the amount of torque that the armature feels depends on the position of the armature as it spins. So you can see that when this is directly vertical, the torque that it feels is at a minimum. When this is directly horizontal, the torque that it feels is at a maximum. So as the motor spins, you actually get, you can get some ripple in your torque out of the motor. Which is kind of interesting, okay? Um, generally speaking, the model for a DC motor that we use well, do I want to talk about that yet? I don't think so. So, so one of the one of the consequences of this mechanism is that these DC motors, these brush DC motors in particular, kick up a huge amount of noise. And I want to show you what this noise looks like. So I have a picoscope open, and I'll start gathering data. And then on the the bench next to me, I have a DC motor set up where I just have, I'm just going to put voltage across the motor and there's no other components in the circuit. It's just applying voltage, in this case, 3.7 volts. Right now you can see this voltage is just hovering at 3.7 volts. I'm just going to apply voltage to the motor and we'll measure, we're going to probe the voltage across the motor. And when I do this, what you'll see is just a huge amount of noise. Right? Big spikes in voltage, big fast spikes in voltage. Um, this, these, these spikes and this noise can be extremely dangerous to other stuff in your circuitry. Particularly if you have a, if your CPU, if your microcontroller is sharing power and ground with this DC motor, spikes like this can be uh, cataclysmic <laughs> to, your, to your microcontroller. So generally speaking, We'll look at some, some example circuits in a moment, but generally speaking, you don't like for your microcontroller to share power or ground with your DC motor. When possible, you like to completely isolate the DC motor on a totally separate, in a totally separate circuit and communicate between the circuit that contains your microcontroller and the circuit that contains your DC motor using some sort of a device that is is electrically isolated. A common one is um, an optical isolator, which we can look at in a moment. But this is an integrated circuit that has a built-in LED next to a built-in phototransistor so that you can drive a separate circuit from the, the microcontroller circuit without actually having an electrical connection between the two circuits, which protects you from this sort of thing. But you can see by this trace, 
that one of the additional elements that you would be inclined to include in parallel with your uh, with your DC motor is some sort of a bypass capacitor. So I have here, <laughs> you can't see it, it's just a, a 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor that I'm going to put uh, in parallel with the DC motor as it's running and you should, we should see the spike noise associated with, with this motor get attenuated pretty significantly. So if I can just get my big dumb fingers to do this. So I put the capacitor in place and what is happening is the capacitor in parallel with the, uh, with the DC motor. Again, we'll look at schematics in a moment, but the capacitor in parallel with the DC motor is providing a path to ground for high frequency noise. So what we're seeing is an attenuation of the high frequency noise from the motor by putting that capacitor in parallel with it. Now, in almost all, every DC motor circuit, there's at least one more component in the circuit with the DC motor. And this is, this is a consequence of the fact that these DC motors are, let's see if there's a picture, there's not. That's okay. Generally speaking, the model that, that we use to model a DC motor is a resistor in series with an inductor in series with a generator. So if you have a DC motor in your circuit, if you have some circuit diagram that has the symbol for DC motor in there, you could model that component by a resistor in series with an inductor in series with a small generator. Um, the generator comes from the back EMF from the motor, which I'll talk about in a moment. That inductor comes from the fact that, generally speaking, these DC motors have, have windings of one variety or another inside of them. Those windings have inductance. You will remember from, gosh, what class? 21, what, what class would it be? Like your intro circuits class, right? The, the equation for the voltage across an inductor. And does anyone remember it off the top of their head? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, 2100. Yeah, yeah, V equals L di dt. V equals L di dt, exactly. So if we, if this DC motor has an inductive element to it, and you open a switch to that DC motor, your L is going to be what? Maybe maybe micro Henry's or so? Maybe 10 to the minus 3-ish Henry's inductor in your motor. But your di dt, your DC motor might be drawing up to like an amp. It's not uncommon for them to draw up to an amp. This one that I have running right here, let me just look. This is just a like dirt cheap little drone motor and this is drawing half an amp. So they're drawing quite significant current. When you open a switch to that, either a mechanical switch or if you're driving it from some sort of a transistor, and you use the transistor to, to uh, restrict current to the device, you are changing the current through that inductor at speeds on the order of like tens of nanoseconds, perhaps. Very, very quickly. So your DIDT term, when you shut off current to your DC motor, is huge, which means which means when you cut off current to your DC motor, the voltage across that motor is going to switch polarity and it's going to get briefly massive. Like you could do the back of the envelope calculations of, on this and say, okay, I have, let's say I have a millihenry-ish inductor in my DC motor. Let's say I'm changing the current from an amp to no amps in 10, ish nanoseconds or so you're looking at thousands or tens of thousands of volts very quickly but a whole lot of volts that will will destroy <laughs> anything that, that isn't protected from that big spike so in addition to in addition to putting a um a bypass capacitor in parallel with the dc motor it is a good idea to also put what's called a snubber diode in uh, in parallel with the DC motor. Let me just show you what I mean. I'm going to pull up an old lab write-up. 
if I go to Olympic 32 page helicopter. So if we look at this, can I make this bigger? If we look at this, it was is the uh, recommended circuit for driving a DC motor shown here. And what you can see is we have our motor, we have a capacitor in parallel with that motor, and we have this snubber diode, which points um, from the, the ground side of the motor to the high side of the motor, which means that when this motor is running in normal operations, there's no current going through this diode, right? It's in the opposite direction. This is here so that when current to this motor is cut off by, me by means of this transistor, what's going to happen, as we just discussed, is the polarity of the voltage across this motor reverses. So suddenly, uh, this becomes the low side, this becomes the high side, and this becomes quite high. This diode is here to provide a path for current to flow through this circuit that does not pose a risk to the other elements of the circuit. So that when, when polarity reverses here and becomes quite high, this diode absorbs all that current. And it needs to be sized to absorb that amount of current. It could be quite large. So this is a 1N4001, which is kind of a beefy, physically sort of a beefy transistor, or I'm sorry, a beefy diode, so it can suck up that power without getting too hot. Um, if you had a really small, physically small diode here, you might get a really hot component by snubbing the voltage out of that DC motor. Does that make sense? So this is here to take away some of that high frequency stuff. This is here to uh, protect the rest of the circuit when current is cut off from the, uh, from the motor and polarity reverses and voltage increases. But even so, so let's see, I'm going to put this diode in place from low to high, show you the picoscope. Even so, oops, that's still a lot of noise. <laughs> and you could do more work, you could do more filtering to get rid of more of that noise, but there's still quite a lot of noise being introduced by the DC motor. So, for that reason, what you can see in the rest of this circuit is the microcontroller circuit here is completely isolated from the motor circuit. So, so these components pictured here, this, this LED communicating with this transistor, this is a phototransistor, all of these components actually exist within the same integrated circuit called a 4N35. So, there's a pin coming out for LED for, for the uh, the LEDs, and then pins coming out attached to this um, this transistor. And when we put current into this LED, it emits photons. Those photons induce current on the phototransistor, right? Which causes current to flow, which ends up driving this FET here, which pulse width modulates the motor for speed control. Pulse width modulation is turning voltage on and off quite quickly to this motors, which is why we have this snubber diode here, right, to account for these sorts of things. But what you can see is that this, this device completely isolates the microcontroller circuit from the DC motor circuit. Now something to keep in mind when you're debugging these sorts of circuits, because I have no doubt that all of you will debug a lot of circuits like this in your career is, the device that we use to debug circuits like this is oscilloscopes. Remember, there is not a shared ground between this circuit and this circuit. So do not put one channel of your scope's ground attached to this ground and the other channel of your scope attached to this ground and try to measure voltages because that's a shared ground. You're eliminating the isolation between the two circuits, right? So you need to be careful when you're debugging and you need to remember, okay, these are two different circuits with different power supplies and different grounds. And when you're debugging them, you cannot debug them simultaneously with both channels of the scope because you're creating a short between your two grounds. Make sense? Uh, Hunter, I have a question. Mm -hmm. What is the reason for those voltage, voltage spikes? Mm 
what is the reason for the voltage spikes? Mm -hmm. Like the, the noise that's getting kicked off? Right. It comes, Bruce might be able to give a more articulate answer than me. It is connected to the brushed, largely connected to the brushed mechanism inside of the DC motor, as far as it, I understand. It is the brushes and you can think of it as a, uh, so every time that the, the brush opens up, there's a uh, chance for a high voltage spike. And so LDIDT indica uh, indicates that you're gonna get a very fast, narrow voltage spike, um, which actually is RF in frequency. It's up in the tens of megahertz in terms of bandwidth. So you are radiating power off of that at the same frequency as the CPU clock. And it's a lot of power. Okay. So will using brushless DC motors solve it somewhat? Brushless DC motors will get rid of the will get rid of the brush noise, but you still need an isolator because of the the LDIDT effects of the fast switch of the PWM switch. All right, okay, thanks. Other questions about this? Uh, so I'm still a bit confused about why like having like a shared ground might still be dangerous. It is that this is RF noise, it, there are, there are current paths where you don't think there's current paths and you and you'll get RF propagating from across one ground lead to the other ground lead with no other connection because you are the other connection or the earth is another connection or unbelievably the whiteboard, the solderless connector is another connection between the boards. Oh, okay. Thanks. This, the, almost entirely incidentally, but just because it's kind of interesting, this notion of electrical isolation is also super important in any sort of biomedical application. So you look at things where you are putting, you are outfitting human bodies with electronics to protect the people wearing or perhaps having those electronics put in their bodies, depending on the application, electrical isolation is wildly important for safety. As little as 30 microamps uh, in, a, in a heart catheter, 30 microamp flow out of AC flow, 60 Hertz flow out of a heart catheter will kill a person. And so getting the leakage current down below a microamp is hard. All we do is isolation. Incidentally, there are a few I, there are a few components here in this circuit that, that I can speak to a little bit. One is you see this resistor coming out of the base of the phototransistor. Um, what this is doing is so so current is being generated on the phototransistor by the photons coming from the LED. What this, the only mechanism by which that current can leak away from the base here is through this resistor. So what this really is doing is setting the bandwidth for this phototransistor. Um, if this resistor were, were too low, the effect would be that you would not be able to generate enough current into the base to actually turn on this transistor. If this, if this resistance was too high, the effect would be that uh, current would not be able to leak away from the base fast enough for you to pulse width modulate at the speed with which you would like to pulse width modulate the motor. So it's this resistor that ends up setting the bandwidth for this communication. Something like a mega ohm in this particular application. Um, but it's going to change depending on your application. So when setting up a circuit like this, some, this device might be one 
might be one for which you arrive at the correct value iteratively and through testing, and the same will likely be true of the value of this capacitor. You likely arrive at the value of this capacitor by iteratively testing and by looking at the output scope trace like we did and seeing at what frequencies is the noise getting kicked up and trying to bypass the most troublesome uh, frequencies. Any other questions about this? I want to I want to talk and just sort of wave my hands at a few other uh, methods of actuation beyond DC motors. I'm going to save my extended discussion of servos for another time since that's what we're using in uh, in lab four. So I won't talk about those right now. But there are others, um, some of which a lot of you likely have experience with, and some of which that are maybe a little bit more uh, exotic in one way or another. Um, so, so let me just conclude this discussion of DC motors. Some things to remember is they're quite high speed. Um, they kick off a lot of noise and you have to deal with that noise. You deal with the noise with bypass capacitors. You deal with the, um, the reverse polarity and increased voltage with a snubber diode. And generally speaking, you want to isolate your control circuitry from your motor circuitry because of the noise that they kick off. But okay, with feedback, you can do speed control of these things, but it does require feedback. Uh, alternatively, a, another flavor of motor that some of you might have experience with are stepper motors, which if there's interest, I could devote some separate time to, but the internal mechanism of a stepper motor is decidedly different from the internal mechanism of a DC motor. Um, just to wave my hands at this a little bit, let, let me see what the, Let's see what the Wikipedia page looks like for stepper motors. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> the way that a stepper motor works, yeah, the, the, I guess this is okay. So, so generally speaking, the way that a stepper motor works is there will be a series of of um, circularly distributed electromagnets that can be turned on or off by the controlling device, generally speaking, a microcontroller. And within this, this circularly distributed series of electromagnets is a permanent magnet. And you can imagine that depending which of the electromagnets you have turned on, there will be one stable configuration, one stable orientation for that permanent magnet. And then if you were to switch off those electromagnets and switch on the ones directly adjacent to it, it would click into a new stable position. So a stepper motor, what characterizes a stepper motor is a, a series, perhaps, perhaps a hundred or so, perhaps less, perhaps more, it depends on the motor you have, but a series of discrete stable orientations for the motor through which you can step. So in one configuration, you send a couple of pulses, click, the motor's in the next configuration, click, it's in the next configuration. And you can have it click through those configurations quickly, not nearly as quickly as you could rotate something like a DC motor. They are not <coughs> suited for particularly high speed applications. But what's nice about them is because of that mechanism, you can do pretty accurate positioning with a stepper motor without necessarily requiring feedback. As long as you were driving it, as long as you're controlling it within its, its operating conditions, just to say you're not trying to do things like ramp it up crazy fast, which is inducing a huge amount of torque because that's a lot of angular acceleration. As long as you are driving it properly, then as long as you're counting, okay, I'm in this step, this step, this step, you can keep quite good track of the position of the motor without any kind of a feedback mechanism, which can be quite nice. They're expensive. <laughs> they do tend to be a bit, a bit more expensive than DC motors, uh, but for certain applications, they're exactly, exactly what you need. Um, a, a more, what's, what's a good word? Well, just a different kind of actuator that you might encounter is a solenoid. It's quite a simple sort of actuator. It's essentially just a loop of wire through which you can pass current. 
and a metal core. You pass current through the loop and induces a magnetic field and pulls the core into the loop. Put current the other way, it pushes the core out of the loop. So it's a, a linear actuator that's great for things like, oh, very low fidelity things like locking doors, perhaps. Right? These sorts of applications where you just want to slide something in, slide something back. Something like a solenoid actuator makes a lot of sense for that. Um, audio speakers can be good actuators. They can move, you know, things quite quickly over small distances. So if you have an application where you're trying to move something quite quickly at kilohertz-ish speeds over small distances, an audio speaker is a pretty good actuator for doing that. If you are interested in moving things much more quickly and over shorter distances, something like a piezo actuator might make sense. I was going through old projects for this class and some... So Bruce, didn't a student use piezos to build a scanning tunneling microscope in this class? That was one of the craziest projects I've ever seen. Yes, uh, you used a pair of piezos uh, to, to build a microscope with which he could image cold atoms and push them around. In five weeks. <laughs> five weeks. It was insane. Probably the hardest thing I ever saw that actually worked. Um, another flavor of action, we're almost out of time, so I'll just mention one more. Uh, a slightly more exotic form of actuation comes from a material called nitinol, um, which we used in in my the spacecraft lab in which I did my PhD. We used it, it quite a lot, but it is a nickel titanium alloy that has this interesting property that when you heat it above a certain temperature, it shrinks by two, by two ish percent. Um, how do you get it hot? Well, you can get it hot with a heat source, or you could get it hot by passing a lot of current through it is another way to actuate night and all. You think 2%, that's not that much, but it is really strong. <laughs> so with one piece of night and all, you can, you can actuate shockingly heavy stuff. And off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what the specifications are. You'll, you'll unfortunately have to Google it, but um, remarkably strong actuation from, it looks just like a wire, but it ha it's a wire with this unusual property that it shrinks a little bit when you heat it, either with a heating element or with current. I seem to remember that a 0.05 inch wire will generate dozens of kilograms of force. It also has this interesting property of being a shape memory alloy, which means you can you can bend it into some shape that you like and get it hot and it will remember you're essentially programming the wire with that shape. And then when it cools down, you can scrunch it up into whatever shape that you like. And when you get it hot again, it pops back into the shape that you programmed, which sends your mind down some pretty interesting applications, right? Programmable shapes in wire, uh, the sorts of mechanical projects that you can think about doing with stuff like that. Pretty interesting. So in any case, we're out of time. I apologize for the technical difficulties today. Um, I'll get it sorted out before next time. And sorry we didn't have the slides that I prepared, but that's okay, I suppose.